Welcome to the world of strange truth. A world where the real and the unreal blur into one. Which of the stories you're about to see are inspired by actual events? Which are totally made up by our clever staff of writers? We have made your choices easy. The names, details, and certain parts of the real stories have been changed. But the basic story points remain true to the original. At the conclusion of this program, we'll let you know which are fiction and which are real enough to be labeled strange truth. And keep in mind, in this show, all things may not be what they seem. Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. Hosted by James Brolin. We live in a world where the real and the unreal live side by side where substance is disguised as illusion and the only explanations are unexplainable. Will you be able to separate stories of truth from fantasy tonight? To do so, you must break through the web of your experience and open your mind to things beyond belief. Two tables. The one on the left is obviously longer and thinner than the one on the right. But let's put this tablecloth on top of the right one. Fits perfectly. The two tables are exactly the same size. What makes them appear different is your perception. Tonight, we have several stories which are guaranteed to challenge your perception. And now that you've been warned, let's begin. How many of us have experienced unhappiness in our jobs? Sometimes when we find ourselves trapped like that, we find some outside interest or activity to keep us going until we can get out and maybe start our own business where we don't have to answer to anyone. Well, that's what Secretary Rebecca Stanza is trying to do. Can she pull off a miracle? Ever since I was a little girl, I've been good with my hands. And now every night I try to use that talent to get me out of the worst job I've ever had, for the worst boss that ever lived. I sell my dolls around the office building to friends and neighbors. Someday it's gonna make me rich. Someday I'll be my own boss. Hello? Oh yes, Mrs. Angelino, I received your order just today. I'll definitely have it for you next week. Yes, everyone really seems to love them. No, no, thank you. Bye. Someday. Someday. Then just put him on the phone, all right? I don't care what he's doing. Well, then you tell him that he will not work for a penny less than 2000 Rebecca, bring me the contract. And how dare you even suggest that he travel, coach? He is a star. This is too hot. Can't drink this. I'm sorry, Mr. Nicholas. I'll... What? What? Can't you see that I am on the phone? Get out of here. <laughs> Scale plus 10. Feel like I got two words to say to you. Drop dead. Rebecca. Where's my coffee? Right away, Mr. Nicholas. Uh, excuse me, are you the dolly? Yes. Rebecca! Coffee! I'm sorry, it might not be a good time, but I'd love to order one of those for my girlfriend. Oh, I think she'd really like Oh, guys in the mill room think your stuff is great. Rebecca, coffee. Now! You! Pick up the mail and get out. Good luck. That night, I kept my spirits up by working on a new doll. And to me, the new doll is always my favorite. Well, aren't you coming along nicely? Another few days and you'll be finished. And then you can live with all my other little friends. Can I tell you a little secret? I like you best of all. Antonio, I promise you I had no idea. You are absolutely right. This is an outrage. 
Rebecca! Yes, Mr. Nicholas? I didn't tell you that I wanted you to take dictation. <laughs> Did I tell her that I wanted her to take dictation? <clears throat> Antonio says he still hasn't received his airline tickets. Where the hell are they? Excuse me, Mr. Nicholas. You know, if I didn't have to spend half my time doing your job, then maybe I could make some money. Excuse me, Mr. Nicholas. Antonio had to come all the way down here because of you. And he's a big star. Where are you going? Not finished with you yet. I want those tickets now. The tickets are on my desk, sir. You asked me to hold on to them so that Antonio would come to the office and sign the contracts. Are you calling me a liar? No, sir. I'm sure it's my mistake. What are you standing around here for? Get him the tickets. Antonio, I'm so sorry. You, you see what I have to put up with. Another doll finished. Someone in Baton Rouge was paying a lot of money for this one. Things were finally starting to look up. Goodbye, Elizabeth. Have a safe trip. Your fiancé is waiting for you. All my life I'd been taught to have a good heart, to live by the golden rule, that there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I still believe that. I believe it completely. But until that day comes, these little dolls will have to do. These little innocent dolls that never hurt me, belittle me, or treat me like I'm a slave. I hate to lose you. You're my biggest client. And I always thought that we had a good relationship. You're sure? There's nothing that I could say to talk you out of it. Well, if you ever change your mind, my door's always open, you know that. Good luck, Vance. Well, I can't wait. Did you bring it? Yeah. I have it right here. Oh, great. Oh, wow, that's great. Oh, she's gonna love that. Good. Rebecca? <sighs> hey, you know what? I hope your doll business makes enough where you kick it out of here. Thanks. Yes, Mr. Nicholas? You know who I just got off the telephone with? No. Vance Gilbert. You know what he just told me? He's leaving me. Did he say why? Why? What the hell do you care? He's not taking money out of your pocket. But you know, maybe I'll just dock your salary to make up for it. I'm tired of being the only one making sacrifices around here. But Mr. Nicholas, I hardly make enough as it is. You think I care about your problems? It's always about you, isn't it? I just lose my biggest client and you're whining about how it's going to affect you. Get out of here. I couldn't wait to go home and finish my new doll. I named it after Mr. Nicholas. That's a tradition in voodoo. <coughs> Suddenly, I didn't care how long it took to leave my job. The power of the voodoo doll has been believed by various cultures for years. Of course, it's dismissed by many other cultures as sheer superstition. But who can really blame Rebecca for trying it out? And it certainly could have been a coincidence that her boss was seized by that excruciating pain. Is this just a clever fiction? Or is there really something to all this? Then again, I'm really too old to be playing with dolls. Fact or fiction, we'll find out at the conclusion of tonight's show. Next, a strange relationship between a child and a toy that's beyond belief. As children, before we form a friendship with another human being, we often bond with an inanimate object. It could be a doll, stuffed animal, or even a special blanket. Sometimes these first relationships can grow extremely intense. Take Kevin Birch. 
He was a sickly child who didn't have a lot of friends. In fact, he only had one. He called him Super Bear. It wasn't easy being Kevin's older sister. As cute as he was, he just wasn't strong like other boys his age. I never wanted him to see that I felt sorry for him, but it was hard to act brave and fill in for mom when I missed her so much myself. Before mom had the auto accident, she gave Kevin a funny little stuffed animal called Super Bear. After she died, I never saw him without it. Look, Amanda, Super Bear's here to save you. You're yeah, right. Can Super Bear help me with my biology test? Super Bear wants to take you and me to a faraway land. He needs our help to fight the monsters who captured the backyard. I'm sorry, kiddo. I can't today. Please. I know your mission is dangerous, but I also know that you and Super Bear are smart enough and strong enough to beat those monsters yourselves. <laughs> Yep. Come on, Sport, we gotta go. Another doctor? Yep. Oh, maybe this one can tell us why Kevin keeps getting dizzy. You know, it's been over a year now. I just wanna know what's going on. He'll be okay, Dad. Don't worry. Come on, pal, we don't wanna be late. Dad, can I bring Bear? Can you bring Bear? Of course you can bring Bear. Can't go without Bear. The doctors didn't have an answer for Dad, and Kevin seemed to grow weaker every day. It was putting a lot of stress on everyone, and I knew I should have been kinder, especially if I would have known it was going to be Kevin's last night in our house. Kevin. Kevin. Give me the banana. It's time for bed. But I'm not tired. Maybe not. But what about Bear? If he doesn't get his sleep, Bear won't be strong enough to protect you from all those monsters. Well, Bear is getting sleepy. Come on, buddy, let's go to bed, huh? Daddy, can you tell me a story? Can I tell you a story? Yeah, I'll tell you a story, sport. Come on. Bear! Bear! Come on, Bear. Let's go hear a story, huh, Bear? I hated what I was thinking. Why is Kevin always the center of attention? And the king and the queen proclaimed a national holiday, and the people were so happy, there was dancing in the streets. And everyone ate candy. <laughs> yes, and everyone ate candy. And everyone was so grateful to Kevin and to Bear for saving the world. Dad was amazing. He had a way of lifting everyone's spirits. Yep. I sure did. That is some bear you got there, kiddo. Me and Bear's gonna be together forever. I love you, Kevin. Poor little Kevin. He seems so fragile. I'll put him in his PJs tonight, okay? Thanks, Dad. Come on. Good night, Amanda. Good night, Kev. Let's get you upstairs, huh, kiddo? The next day, when I came home from school, all my worst fears came true. Our neighbor, Mrs. Sanders, was waiting for me. Kevin's collapsed, honey. He's in the hospital. Your dad asked me to take you there. When I got to the hospital, I found Dad was sitting in a trance over Kevin's bed. One look at his face, and I knew it was over. <laughs> Kevin passed away that afternoon. Again, I was trying to be strong, this time for Dad. Suddenly, I saw Super Bear in the corner. Somehow, this feeling came over me. Super Bear and Kevin had to be together. Dad, we have to go to the hospital. We have to see Kevin. I think they moved him by now. To find out what was wrong, the doctors wanted to do uh, 
an autopsy. No! No! We have to go now! We have to go! We have to go now! I must have sounded hysterical, but I knew what I was doing. Kevin and Superbear had never been separated in life. I wanted Kevin to have him, even in death. All I wanted to do was get to Kevin's body and place the bear in his arms. But I had no idea where to find him. Dad was following me, trying to calm me down. I ran right back to Kevin's room, the last place I'd seen him alive, but they'd already moved him somewhere else. Dad finally took over and asked a nurse where they had taken Kevin's body. She pointed in the direction of the morgue. That's where they'd be performing the autopsy. I don't know why, but I felt like I was running out of time. I had to get Kevin that bear. Father, can we have a moment, please? Mm doctors had no explanation for what happened, but we really didn't care. We had Kevin back. I was just grateful for a feeling I couldn't explain, and a little bear with a red cape. Could this story have happened? Was Kevin brought back to life by his favorite toy? Or maybe he wasn't really dead at all. Maybe an attending physician misread some vital sign and pronounced him dead too soon. In any event, the challenge is now ours to decide if this story was the work of Super Bear. Or the work of a writer's active imagination. Is this story true or false? We'll tell you in the final moments of tonight's show. Next, who holds the key to the secret of the mysterious lock on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction? For most of us, this door is a sign of our times. Notice the different security locks designed to keep unwanted visitors out. This one slides, this one bolts, and this one actually needs a key to open from inside. That's the type of lock Aunt Connie has in our story. You see, Connie has been a trusting soul too long, and her neighborhood is changing. But the real thing that's about to change is her life. I had a key to Aunt Connie's apartment, so I could basically come and go as I pleased. But the lock was so weak I didn't even use the key that day. I was happy she wasn't home though, because there was something I needed to take care of, and I needed time alone in her apartment to do it. I love my Aunt Connie, and I worried that the neighborhood she lived in was getting too dangerous. That lock on Aunt Connie's door couldn't keep out a 10th rate pickpocket. I had a personal reason for keeping Aunt Connie's apartment safe from harm. It was very important to me. Aunt Connie came home a few minutes later, and I knew she would be happy to see me. I was her favorite. Ever since her operation, Aunt Connie walked and talked a lot slower. In fact, she had become almost childlike, in a lovable way. Hello? When I heard her voice, I came right out. Oh, oh, Bradley! Hi, Aunt oh, Connie. What are you doing here? Well, I had a few minutes to kill, so I thought I'd come by and see you. 
That's why I gave you a key, dear. You're welcome anytime. Thanks, Aunt Connie. You know, I can always count on you. You must be hungry. Now, let me fix you some lunch. That'd be great. Thanks, Aunt Connie. It was a good time to make my suggestion. You know, Aunt Connie, you should have somebody look at your front door. I just walked right in. I didn't even need to use my key. What's that, dear? I said you need a new lock on your front door. I used the opportunity to hide my little secret. That package could be the ticket to one of those nice, safe senior communities. But until I could swing it, I had to make sure nobody got their hands on it. Every time she went out, there was nobody to watch the apartment. I decided I had to do something right away. I don't remember who recommended the locksmith company to me. You're gonna be safe now, Aunt Connie. Oh, I hope so. The neighborhood has become so dangerous lately. I looked over at Aunt Connie, sitting there so trusting and so vulnerable, but I didn't have a clue what was in store for her, or for me. The locksmith treated Aunt Connie like she was a little child. She always brought that out in people. Now. You're sure this is the safest lock? Yes, ma'am. No one is going to come through this door to hurt you. I guarantee it. Oh, thank you. Those turned out to be memorable words. You gotta go, Aunt Connie. Oh, aren't you forgetting something? Oh, you're the best, Aunt Connie. Oh. <laughs> oh, bye. The great thing about Aunt Connie was. I didn't even have to ask for a key. She insisted that I have one. He's such a good boy. <laughs> You'll have nothing to worry about now, Mrs. Howard. The kind of lock I ordered had to be opened from the inside by a key. I'd heard they were the best, and that's what I wanted Aunt Connie to have. It's like Aunt Connie used to tell me when I was a kid. Better safe than sorry. And Connie felt safer almost immediately, and I did too. I knew my envelope would be secure. That key sure didn't look like anything special, but it turned out to be the key to a mystery I still don't understand. It was around 2.30 in the afternoon the next day. The weather was nice, so that meant Aunt Connie would be coming home from the bank. You could set your clock by her. The witnesses said that she came home her usual way, and of course, she never noticed that she was being watched. When the man saw her enter the building, he must have figured this would be a snap. An old lady, home alone, what could be easier? The man waited just long enough before he sneaked into the building. On the way up, he asked someone where the old lady's apartment was. He said he had a delivery for her. When he got to the door, he prepared to terrorize Aunt Connie. And Connie would surely have opened the door. Why not? She always did. Coming, but that was before the special coming. lock. Coming. Just a minute. Who is it? Uh, can you help me? Uh, need help? Uh, I'm sorry. You know, I, I can't understand you. Please help me. It's a matter of life and death. Oh. Please let me in. I, I need your help. Oh. The door won't open. Please, let me in. I, I need your help. Oh, do you want me to call the police? Uh, no, no, I I'll try another apartment. For some reason, the lock wouldn't budge. But as soon as the man left, Aunt Connie tried it again, and the strangest thing happened. This time, it opened easily. She checked the hall to see if the stranger was still there. Thank goodness for everyone, he was gone. Even though she didn't know it then, the lock had saved Aunt Connie's life. After about an hour, the cop showed up to investigate. Police, open up! Sorry to 
bother you, ma'am. Your neighbor called us about a disturbance at your door earlier today. Did you positively identify this man as the man who was outside your door today? I don't know. See, I didn't see him. Um, my door wouldn't open. Well, that's a good thing. Because he's been robbing people their social security checks. Oh, my. Uh, don't worry, we got him. He won't be bothering anyone around here for a while. Oh, thank you. Two months had gone by, and then Aunt Connie had another uninvited visitor. Mrs. Howard? Coming. Coming. Hello. Who is it? I'm Doc Thomas with the county building inspector. I'm here to check the wiring in your apartment. There was no Doug Thomas in the county inspector's office. Of course, Aunt Connie couldn't have known that. So she was perfectly happy to let him in. I, I'm sorry. I can't get the lock to turn. Oh. Can you come back later? Yeah, sure. Aunt Connie didn't understand why her lock wouldn't open, so she decided to give the lock company a call. That's when things started to get even stranger. Yes. No, um, the number for forever safe lock and key. No. You sure you have no distance? It was a Tuesday when I called Aunt Connie. Are you, are you going to be there long? Oh, you are? You're, you're not going anywhere today? Make her do it, man. Yo, maybe I can stop by later. You got five minutes, you're a dead man. It's no sweat. I got a key. I was in a jam. A big one. And Connie, it's me, Brad. <laughs> okay, honey. <laughs> Just a and Connie, I'm in a hurry. I needed to get my package and get out. <laughs> look, look, this new key isn't working. Oh, but, but the lock won't turn. What did you do? Just open the door. I, I, I'm trying. <laughs> and Connie, just open the door, please. I, 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 and Connie. I, I'm trying. The door won't. And Connie, please open the door now. I'm trying. No what one is going to get through this door Connie, to harm me. Now. I guarantee you. Connie. Please, just open the door! Hey, Connie, listen to me. I need you to open the door. Just open the door, Hey, Connie. I wasn't going to harm her, but I found out later that the drug dealers I was involved with were out to get her. They thought I had told her their names. I had to disappear for a while, but as long as she had that lock on the door, Aunt Connie would be forever safe. Aunt Connie, open the door! What is the explanation for this mystery lock? And why wouldn't the lock open when evil was outside the door? Was it simply the failing coordination of a woman growing older, or was it Connie's own wise instinct that subconsciously kept her from opening the door? Or is there some other possibility? 
Maybe Connie was being watched over by some presence even more protective than the strongest lock in the world. Or maybe this story never happened. Was this story real? We'll find out at the end of our show. Next, a troubled teenage romance carries a curse that's beyond belief. Story of young lovers defying the wishes of their parents is as old as Romeo and Juliet and as new as today. The next story involves an ill-fated love revenge and things that go bump in the night. And as you'll see at the conclusion of our story, Romeo and Juliet were never like this. Just ask the neighbors. I love your eyes. I do. <laughs> now, I'm no busybody, but when two kids are carrying on in broad daylight, how can you help but look? Especially when you live next door. That's right, Tom. You're welcome. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh. Here you go. Thanks. I'll call you later. Tiffany was only 16 years old. And it was no secret, her father didn't like that young man with the piercing eyes. I don't want you spending so much time with that boy. Daddy, just give me a ride home from the library. I don't care. When I ask you to do something, I expect you to listen. Here you go again. I think I have reason to be concerned when my daughter's seeing a criminal. He is not a criminal. He stole a car. That was like three years ago, so he made a mistake. It's not like he's done anything wrong since then. You don't trust anybody anymore. Especially me. That night, there would be sounds coming from the Wilson house that the whole neighborhood would hear. Honey, you okay? Just great. She's gonna be fine. I uh, know. Who was that? that? Sounds like it's coming from your room. What's going Stay on? Stay there. I'm going to check it out. Dad? Dad, are you okay? Daniel? Nothing would turn off. I had to unplug everything in your room. Hey, maybe it was just a short. The Wilsons had a habit of keeping their windows open, and the sound carried around that place, so I couldn't help hearing something else a few nights later. in here. I'm gonna turn up the heat. It wasn't a dream, Mom, and you know it. Something's happening here, and I'm scared. I saw Mrs. Wilson working on the lawn the next morning. I was determined to find out what was going on there, and to tell her what I knew about that creepy old house. Samantha! <sighs> Mary, hi. Bye. Can I just ask you something? I thought I heard a scream from your house last night. Well, Tiffany had a nightmare. Oh. Mary, you've lived here a long time, right? Ever since I was a little girl. Well, have you ever heard of anything strange happening at our house? Like weird noises or sounds? When we first moved into this neighborhood, a banker owned your place. And he converted it into a boarding house. A woman, Mildred Bennett, and her son, Stuart, lived up there in that room. It's Tiffany's room. Stuart was the most handsome boy. 
He had jet black hair and the most beautiful eyes. They almost glowed. There wasn't a woman alive who wouldn't turn around when Stuart Bennett walked by. Sounds like Tiffany's boyfriend. Well, he had the bad luck to fall in love with the banker's daughter. The banker hated Stuart Bennett. He did everything in his power to keep them apart. I know what that's like. Well, did it work? No. Her father found out that the two were planning to elope. He was a powerful man. He ran Stuart and his mother out of town. Was this kid that bad? I didn't think so at first. But Stuart swore he'd get revenge. One night, he returned, and he set the house on fire. My mother and I got here just as he was shot by the police. He died right there on those steps. I'll never forget those eyes staring right through me. Some people say that he still lives in this house. Are you saying we're haunted by Stuart Bennett? I'm not trying to scare you. It's just an old story. I'll catch you later. See ya. I guessed what Mrs. Wilson was thinking because I was thinking the same thing. Was there a connection somehow between Tiffany's boyfriend, Tom, and the ghost of Stuart Bennett? I happened to be up at 2 a.m. the next morning. That's when Tom brought Tiffany home and all the shouting began. Very, very Do you realize what time it is? You are never to see this boy again. Dad. I don't want to hear about it. And you, you are out of here. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll call you tomorrow. Don't bother. Your dad's out of control. I'm gone. Tiffany, upstairs. Now! After Tom made that threat, the Wilsons asked me to sort of keep an eye on their house when they were out. One night, I heard a prowler. I called 911 and then waited for the police to come. I couldn't believe it. It was almost as if Stuart Bennett was reincarnated and trying to set the house on fire again. I wasn't about to tangle with the teenager, so I just prayed that the police would show up soon. Free! Please, don't shoot! Officer, I'm the woman who called you. Stay back, no one needs to get hurt. Now, turn around, slowly. Oh my God. Tiffany really inhabited by the soul of Stuart Bennett? And if she was simply a troubled teenager trying to exact revenge against her father, then how do you explain those glowing eyes? And what about the strange goings on in the house? Soon after her arrest, Tiffany broke off all relationships with her boyfriend and things returned to normal. And by the way, there are people who say Tiffany is all grown up now with teenagers of her own. These same people also say she's the strictest parent in town. Of course, these are the people who believe that this story really happened. <laughs> the truth about this story will be revealed in our final act. Next, a tale of a bizarre meeting you'll never forget on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. And now another story to challenge your perception of reality. Imagine a dark train platform on a chilly March night over 100 years ago. A rainstorm sends sheets of rain across the platform that has become dangerously crowded. And the distinguished actor arrives at this Jersey City railway station. He's just finished a performance of Hamlet at New York's Winter Garden Theater. And he's now on his way to Philadelphia to visit his sister. Well, as he joins the crowds, pushing and shoving on the platform, he notices a young college student out of the corner of his eye. And suddenly the boy is jostled violently and pushed towards the edge of the platform. Struggling to keep his footing, he loses his balance and falls onto the tracks between the two cars where the actor tries to alert the engineer. But it's too noisy and then it's too late. The train has already started to move. So quickly the actor rushes to the edge of the platform, reaches down, and with all his might pulls the young student to safety. Thank you, sir. Well, after the train pulls away, in a quiet moment, 
the actor and the student introduce themselves to each other. And the actor turns out to be the brother of another actor, one who's soon to become extremely famous. And the college student turns out to be the son of a prominent American politician. Well, in less than three weeks' time, the actor's brother would kill the college student's father. The actor was Edwin Booth, brother of John Wilkes Booth. And the student was Robert Lincoln, son of President Abraham Lincoln. It's a fact or fiction. You decide at the end of tonight's show. And now it's time to see if you can separate shadow from substance. Let's see which of our stories were false and which were inspired by actual events. We started tonight's show with the doll maker who found her own method of revenge. Are you calling me a liar? No, sir. I'm sure it's my mistake. What are you standing around here for? A fraudulent tale that never took place? That's exactly right. It's false. And what about the story of little Kevin, who seemed to be brought back to life by his favorite toy, Super Bear? Possible, you say? Not this time. A story like this did take place. And how did you judge the plot of the mysterious lock that somehow protected the aging Aunt Connie? Just a minute. Aunt Connie, I'm in a hurry. Oh. Look, the new key isn't working. Oh. Now, this one never could have happened, right? Wrong. It did happen. And what did you think about the tale of the teenage girl whose life included a troubled boyfriend and a house with a terrible curse? Could a story like this be true? Not this time. It's a fraud. And what about the story I told tonight? Was it inspired by actual events? Yes, it was. So, were you able to spot the difference between fact and fiction this evening? Three of our stories were inspired by fact. The other two were fictional. Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction will continue. Well, until next time, keep in mind that what seems to be impossible can often turn out to be a strange truth. Good night. Join us next time on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. This is Don LaFontaine.